Okay. Uh, today I was going to talk about MIT and leadership. This is actually a presentation I made to the alumni leadership conference, but it's based on a number of talks I've given uh, for about the last 12 years, and I'll, I'll describe as I go through uh, where some of this comes from. But first, let me uh, put up something. This is a quote about MIT. There's no question but that the Massachusetts Institute of Technology is the best technical school in the country. I have found the graduates of tech to have a better, more practical, more usable knowledge as a class than the graduates of any other school in the country. The salvation of America lies in the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. I always say, I don't know whether I should stand up and shout hooray or I should hold my head down in a moment of silent reverence for uh, for Edison's approach. Uh, well, I have some other quotes from Edison, but he was uh, rather effervescent about practical training of engineers. Um, you have to remember that that uh, engineering is is basically a fairly new field. Uh, the first engineering school in the country was. Uh, West Point in the 1790s. And the second engineering school, anybody know what the second engineering school was? It was RPI in 1824. And that was because they were building the Erie Canal. And uh, the first field at RPI, field of engineering, was a field called civil engineering. Why do they call it civil engineering? To distinguish it from military engineering. Um, and uh, they were building bridges and buildings and canals uh, for the Erie Canal. Um, in any case, people, the third engineering school, let me back up, was MIT in 1861, didn't start classes until 1865. So MIT was one of the first engineering schools and helped define engineering in the United States. And it's sort of an interesting story about how uh, from 1873 to 1914, Harvard tried on three, three, three occasions and MIT um, partially agreed on several of those occasions to, for MIT to merge with Harvard become Harvard's engineering school, but it's never worked out for various reasons. Nonetheless, the world looks to MIT for leadership um, in engineering and actually in some other fields too. But what makes MIT what it is? Well, first of all, Ed Schein over the Sloan School of Management says MIT is an iconoclastic society. Does anybody remember what iconoclastic is? I agree. An icon is an image and class comes from the verb meaning to break. So we break down images. MIT likes to analyze things, tear them apart. But fortunately, in general, we may be a kind of classic tearing things down, but we tend to put, like to put them back together. Uh, there's sort of a culture at MIT you like to find where someone else is wrong and show them what's right. And that's partly what I call the MIT culture of creativity. Uh, MIT has a culture of creativity that's learned not just in the classroom, but probably more importantly, on campus as you interact with all the other students. Now going to what a number of people have said about what they learned at MIT, Dick Simmons, for whom Simmons Hall over here, the new undergraduate dorm is named, someone who's been financially very successful, Dick Simmons said, MIT taught him to work hard. Um, MIT teaches you to work gracefully under pressure. That was my, my old thesis advisor, Bob Rose, used to say that. I used to think that was Bob's phrase until a few years ago I learned it actually as a Yiddish, Yiddish proverb. But nonetheless, uh, not at MIT, but the idea of working gracefully under pressure. And Bob applied it to MIT. And I often say that MIT will take you to your limit, whatever your limit is. Um, I actually learned to work hard when I was a student at MIT. Um, I don't know if I work gracefully under pressure, but I actually try to avoid the pressure that's around here. There is a tremendous amount of pressure. I remember once um, I was at a, uh, uh, a committee meeting or something in Washington, and the guy Cy Ostrak, who used to be foreign secretary, or, or I can't remember, foreign secretary, he was home secretary of the National Academy of Engineering, uh, noticed my name tag and said I was from MIT. He says, boy, you know, I've spent a couple of weeks at MIT over the years. Um, it's a great place, but how can you take that place all the time, the intensity of that place? Because there is a certain amount of intensity here. However, 95% of the uh, pressure at MIT, whether you're a faculty member or a student, 95% of the pressure is self-inflicted. Okay? We're going to talk about that. 
Uh, so far as taking you to the limit, we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, but what, what makes someone successful? There are no secrets to success. It's the result of preparation, hard work, and learning from the future. I got this uh, quote from a number of years ago when Colonel Powell was still in the Army uh, as, as Chief of Staff. But you have to always be adaptable to whatever's going to happen. Um, one of the things I've noted as I've looked at some of the faculty around MIT, there's a lot of people who will work very hard for a certain amount of time and um, to, in order to go through the seven year, 10 year cycle and whatnot. But some of them never really learn to change the way they work uh, in a way such that they can actually handle this long time. They, they end up with something that's not sustainable. Uh, they're working so hard. So I actually put this together a few years ago. If you want to be successful professionally, you first have to learn to do your job in 40 hours a week, and then you have to, if you want, you can work 80 hours a week to excel. But if you can't do your job in 40 hours a week, you're in the wrong job. You've got to change the way you manage things. The way I managed myself when I was an assistant professor was different than when I got a little older, became an associate professor, then I became a full professor. I, every about five years, I had to change the way I managed my time. Uh, as a young professor, yeah, I could go into the laboratory a little bit and I could work with the students. Actually, as a student, I'd go in the laboratory and I would do the work. As a young professor, I would go in the laboratory and show them how to do the work. Okay. As I got a little older, I had a technicians, and I didn't go to the laboratory as much. I had the students who were already there that I had trained, the older students, trained the younger students. Um, keep on going through, when I became a department head and had to administer um, four or 500 people, I had to learn, I had to continually adapt to be able to do my job in 40 hours a week. If I then wanted to work more to excel at my job, I could. There's a problem, though, of people who have, who never learned to get their job done in 40 hours a week and can only get their job done in 80 hours a week. There's nothing wrong with doing that for five or six months, but it's not sustainable for a whole career to end up having to work 80 hours a week because you have to just to keep up. Now, I'll change thought a little bit. Uh, Joel Moses, former provost at MIT, always whenever he see, sees me quoting him on this, uh, that MIT is a no-praise zone, he always points that out to someone else, but I never can remember who someone else originally said it. But Joel use, uses this quote a lot. Um, and there's a reason for it. Um, he's trying to get people to recognize that uh, there's not enough recognition of appreciation around here. I remember about two years ago, I was in a meeting where it was 2001 when the uh, um, the endowment had gone up 58 percent that year. Okay, they were very happy, and they were no longer the administration was no longer uh, feeding poverty. And the provost Bob Brown was there, and he you know, kind of giving delivering the good news. We just had a faculty meeting a couple of weeks ago, delivering the bad news that they now uh, you know overspent again. Uh, and so even though they had all this money two years ago, they've They've blown, blown it and more. Um, but nonetheless, at the time, Bob finished his positive thing about, well, we're, we're doing very well financially. And I said, well, Bob, you're doing well financially now, but there's still a deficit at MIT, and that's an appreciation deficit. We don't really tell people often enough that we appreciate them. Well, maybe that's partly because the first day I, Bob Brown was dean of engineering um, came to see me when I was department head, he made this quote because I was talking about trying to appreciate people more and stuff. He said, the MIT faculty and students are reasonably bright but insecure. That's why they work so hard. If they received praise, they wouldn't be so insecure. They would not feel the need to work so hard. So from his point of view, we're trying to make people feel insecure, okay? So they work hard, I guess. Or as Pogo said, we have met the enemy and he is us, okay? Uh, the culture, that's the culture of creativity, this pressure that goes on. It doesn't have to be that way, and I'm going to talk about that. But there are plenty of people around here who tend to induce the pressure. Now, 
Uh, we have to remember that the students at MIT are not just regular people. I remember when I came to MIT as a, as a freshman, I'd never been north of the Mason-Dixon line when I uh, came up here. I never ha didn't have enough money to come visit the school before I got admitted. And I came up here uh, that first week of my freshman year, and there were some people who picked me up at Logan Airport and were driving me down Star Drive, and they pointed across the river and said, that's MIT. I said, how can that be? We're not out of the city yet. That was from the south where you had big land grant colleges and stuff out in the country. And uh, I came here, I was sort of, I was in awe of the place, and many people are. Um, and after a couple of years, after having worked in the labs and stuff and getting to know some people and seeing kind of the silly things and dumb things they do, I realized, so what's the big deal, you know, about MIT people? But that's the problem of being involved in this environment too long. Uh, you tend to forget that when you get out there in the real world, it's all relevant. And that's what happened to me in the first six weeks after I finished my uh, doctoral degree and went out to work. That first six weeks, I said, oh, it's all relevant, okay? Now, it used to be only 35%, but currently 45% of all MIT freshmen were valedictorians in high school. That's a pretty amazing number, okay? And in fact, there's a serious problem with that in that the MIT students never really had to work very hard in high school. Um, to excel academically. Uh, most of them are naturally bright, and high schools didn't challenge them very much. Um, and when they come here, they're kind of thrown into things. They're used to being number one. They're used to competing with other people on an academic basis because they'd always win, okay, because they're at the top of their class. And they come here, and all of a sudden, on average, they're average, okay? And it's sort of a shock. But that, that's actually a good thing. We have to remember that MIT undergraduate students are within the top three out of ten percent of the population, academically or you know test scores, whatever you want to call. And in fact, if you talk to graduate students, the graduate students, there's a select selectivity that's only about the top twenty percent of the undergraduates can get into the MIT graduate school. So graduate students are kind of in the better than one out of ten thousand. Uh, if you graduate in the top. 10% of your class at MIT, academically, you'd be top one out of 100,000. But you're not yet one out of a million, okay? You're not one, yet one in a million. In fact, one in a million, it would be the top 300 people in the country, right? There's only 300 million people in the country, so getting to be one in a million is, uh, is a little bit harder. But that's not saying that some of the MIT people don't make that. However, there's no greater burden than having great potential. Um, and with that potential, Come certain types of responsibilities. Um, one of the greatest values to me of an MIT education is this problem that we had students who never learned to fail in high school. And you come here, and as I say, MIT will take you to your limit, whatever it is. You have the opportunity to fail here. You will find that you will fail. No matter how good you were as a student in high school, whether you were, you know, one of the best violinists or uh, trombone players, and we have some excellent musicians and students. We actually have some fairly good athletes. Bright people with other skills, doesn't matter what your skill is, you'll find other people at MIT who can who are better. Okay? Um, so this is one of the first times you really learn to fail. I remember um, the first time I got a, a 30 on a quiz when the average was like 70 for the class, you know? And it was sort of a humbling experience, okay? You, you don't really know what to think. Um, it's important to learn to fail. It's better to fail now than to fail later in life when it really makes a difference. I used to tell students, uh, don't worry about your grade on the quiz five years from now, it won't make a difference. And uh, students always hated that. And you know, when I gave this talk a couple of weeks ago to the alumni conference, this one, can't call her a young woman, she's probably in her 40s, but she came up to me and she had been in my class. And she said, you know, I remember you're telling me that. Um, and I didn't really believe it at the time, but it, it gave me some encouragement. And you're absolutely right. It doesn't make a difference five years from now what your grades are. No one ever asked me what my MIT undergraduate cum was, or my graduate cum. I don't even know what my graduate cum was. I happen to know my undergraduate cum, just uh, for other reasons. In any case, MIT's culture of creativity comes from, I believe, three things. One, hard work. The students and the faculty 
and the staff, everybody around here tends to try to excel. And there's a culture around here that's different than most other places. Uh, I, I have a little bit of pro problem saying that because I've been here so much of my career, not all of my career, but much of it. Um, but when I talk to other people on the outside or have come from other places, they do say that there's just a greater intensity in this place. And that's one of the reasons why MIT requires that in order to get a degree from MIT, you have to have a residency requirement. You have to live on campus. You have to experience the whole ambiance of MIT. You have to live through that. Learning to fail is another important aspect of being here. You have outstanding people, very qualified, some of whom, if they hadn't come to this location, would not have learned to fail. And if you don't learn to fail, you can't learn to excel. Okay? You can learn to operate at a certain level, which might be a reasonably high level, but unless you fail, you really don't know what it takes to really be the best. Okay? You have to learn to fail. And it's better to do it here than somewhere else. Now, the other thing you need is a little bit of humility. Not necessarily insecurity, and unfortunately, MIT is very good about giving people insecurity. The administration hates to hear me say this, but they did a study about 10 years ago, a survey of students, and they found that students had less self-confidence at the end of four years at MIT than they did when they came here. Okay? And every time I say it, there's some, someone from the upper administration, that's not what the surveys showed. Okay, you interpret the survey your, your way, and I'll interpret it my way. I read the questions, I read the responses, you know, the percentage responses, and the students basically said they felt less confident. That's my interpretation. Go and talk to the administration, they'll put their spin on it, because they don't want to say, they don't want to admit that we make people feel insecure. Okay? In fact, some of them are trying to make people feel insecure. That's the way they motivate them, they think. Well, you don't need insecurity, but you do need humility. If you want, this part, that's part of what learning to fail is all about, is giving you a little humility so you realize that you're not necessarily the best at all things, that you can excel, um, and not to be so arrogant. There are some schools, um, I often say we're the second most arrogant school in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, there are some schools that don't have the same type of more uniform level of, of excellence that generate a certain amount of arrogance among their students. Um, and you have to be careful, careful about that uh, as far as that goes. Um, now, why what are we trying to do in educating people? Um, Robert Hutchins was the uh, president of the University of Chicago, I believe in the 1950s. He was a great leader, built the University of Chicago to be one of the great educational institutions in the country. And he later on went on to become editor of the great books in the Western world. But uh, he said, the object of a liberal education is not to teach the young all they will ever need to know, it is to give them the habits, ideas, and techniques they need to continue to educate themselves. Thus, the object of formal institutional liberal education in youth is to prepare the young to educate themselves throughout their life, lifelong education. Okay? You know, I, I often, I've been to many faculty meetings, uh, and in fact, more recently, I was reading a history of MIT from 100 years ago. So they had these same discussions at faculty meetings 100 years ago where people say, oh, you need a fifth year to have a professional engineering degree. You know, MDs have to go on for four years beyond their bachelor's degree, and lawyers are certain, you know, you don't really become a professional um, with just four years of education. And um, I, I remember faculty saying, at faculty, at faculty meetings, people getting up and saying, well, you know, we need a fifth year for the undergraduate uh, engineering degree because we can't teach them all they need to know in just four years. Well, uh, Hutchins said something about that. The mind is not a receptacle. Information is not education. Education is what remains after the information that has been taught has been forgotten. Okay? Um, 
And that's what education really is. I've never been in favor of lengthening the undergraduate degree because when these people say, well, they haven't learned everything that they need to know, I say, you know, the average on your quizzes was 65 out of 100. So you can argue they didn't learn one third of it anyway, right? So why do you think that when they graduate after four years, they've learned everything you taught? If you think the mind is a receptacle and information is education, then yeah, you probably need another 10 years beyond the degree because they're not gonna know everything whenever they graduate. If, on the other hand, the purpose of education is to teach people how to think and learn how to do things on their own, then that's a whole different philosophy and you ought to be able to do it in three years or four years. You don't need a fifth year or a sixth year. In fact, that's to a certain extent, um, I describe in a somewhat cynical way what the difference is between a bachelor's degree, a master's degree, and a doctoral degree, and I may have actually told some of you this before. But a bachelor's student has to go in the lab, come out alive, and write it up. That's all that's really required. After four years, you're not going to keep them from graduating because they did a lousy thesis. You can give them an A, a B, or a C. You can give them a grade. Um, you can't give them a D because they won't graduate if they get less than a C in a required course in their major. But you can give them a B or a C. Now, I've actually never even given a B for a bachelor's degree, but I can imagine if a student really did nothing and had a terrible document. But as long as it's got something. I remember when I turned in my bachelor's thesis, the department head was in the, uh, the student's office at the time, and I came in and turned it in, and he took it and he flipped through it like this, you know, and he says, so, oh, yep, words, graphs, pictures, looks like a thesis, okay? You know, that, that's, all, that's what Tom King said. So I realize that's all you need. Now, a master student has to go into the lab, come out alive with some results, and write it up. And a doctoral student has to go into the lab, come out alive with some results, and explain some of them. Not all of them, but they have to explain some of them. That's the difference between a bachelor's and a master's and a doctoral. It's a pretty cynical view, but in fact, the basic, that's what it is. A doctoral student has to be able to explain something. A master's student doesn't even have to be able to explain something. They have to just show that they can actually generate some results. You know, you get a master's student who does a thesis where he actually can explain something, that's a real bonus, and that's starting to get towards the level of performing at a doctoral level. So what makes a doctoral degree a doctoral degree? Well, a doctoral degree is one in which you take a project probably for at least two years, and you work on the same project intensively. And it'll be some time, tell students, they're always going to hit a brick wall. For me, the brick wall, I was doing superconductivity, the brick wall was putting samples down into liquid helium. It was just terrible. I, you know, I've been doing it for a year and a half. And you have to slowly put, you can't just drop in the liquid helium while the helium vaporizes away. You have to put it down and slowly let it pre-cool in the vapor. And so about, you know, an inch every 15 seconds putting this thing in by hand. I mean, maybe I could have developed an automated machine to do it. But I had done hundreds of these tests, and I was so sick of it, I would go around and try to do anything else, find something to do, you know, clean out my desk, you know, you know, check to see if I have any hang nails or something, before I would go out there. And when I just couldn't think of anything else to do, I'd actually go out there and make one of the measurements I needed to make. And I've, I've seen it with students over the years. You always hit a brick wall. Now it might be an intellectual brick wall. It might be, you know, a motivational brick wall. There's some brick wall, and you have to, as a doctoral student, learn to go. I say over it, under it, around it, or through it. Okay, you gotta get around. There's, you know, there's only you go top, bottom, around, or through the center. Right? There's some, you know, just think of the possibilities. <laughs> you have to figure out how to get past that brick wall. There. Are, some universities where one third of the students who pass the examinations for the doctoral degree will never go on and get the doctorate, finish the thesis. They call it ABD out of PhD, all but dissertation. Okay, they finish all the course requirements, pass all the exams, but they just can't get that thesis done. Now we have a very very small fraction, probably less than one percent, of people who don't get that dissertation around here, but. Um, it is an important thing, and it really has nothing to do with what your thesis is about. Is about it's learning to hit the wall and figure out how to get past it. Okay, and you don't have to get a doctoral degree to do that. If you learn to take a problem that just seems insurmountable and keep on working to find a way around it, okay? and there's no there's no single way around it. 
that's something that will serve you well in the future and actually will help you become a leader who can solve problems that the rest of the world can't. Now, a few years ago in the MIT magazine or uh, weekly newsletter or newspaper tech talk, there was a quote from an MIT student who said, why do MIT alums usually end up working for Yale and Harvard graduates? Okay. I thought that was an interesting uh, way to phrase it, and I've heard people kind of say things similar to that over the years. In that same article, there was a quote from Alan Spoon, the chief operating officer of the Washington Post, for the major newspaper, it happens to be an MIT graduate. Um, I'm convinced that MIT's already large contribution to our society would sharply expand if its graduates were even better advocates and raconteurs of their views and labors. And that basically says you've got to learn to communicate. What you, what you know. You can be the best engineer in the world, but if you can't communicate it to other people, then you're not going to be able to convince them. I often tell my students that when they give a presentation, you better give it with some enthusiasm, because if you don't believe it, no one else is going to believe it. But you'd also better give it in a way that people can understand it. Uh, a number of years ago, in 1988, I took the Sloan program for senior executives, and it was the first time I'd ever heard Lester Thoreau speak. Okay, now, um, Lester is a very engaging speech, speaker. He was dean at the Sloan School at the time. He was, uh, but he was sort of a uh, fairly common commentator on 60 Minutes or some some sort of show. He, he had written a number of books that made it to like number two on the bestseller list. He once said, uh, this is Diana, Diana's book, um, you know, um, uh, the uh, princess from, of, of uh, the British Isles, uh, made number one. He says, well, never compete with the princess, okay? His book uh, came out uh, as number two in the bestseller list after hers. Now, some of his colleagues in Sloan School feel that the way he presents things is a little too simplistic, and so they actually, instead of calling him Lester Thoreau, they actually call him Less Than Thoreau. Okay. Um, but it doesn't matter, he's just a very engaging speaker. Twelve years ago, fifteen years ago, he's getting $30,000 a lecture on the uh, business circuit. Right? No one pays me $30,000 a lecture. He came in, he talked to the 50 of us, and we were just enamored with his talk. It was fantastic. Um, and everybody was talking about it afterwards. The second time he came in a few weeks later, I was sitting there among the 50 people, and they were all just enamored with this talk the second time. And I was sitting there as the engineer, kind of analyzing, now, what did he say? And after he's all done, I said, you know, he didn't say anything I didn't already know, but it was the way he said it. He had little sound bites. I remember a couple years later, I was at a talk that he was giving, and he was lamenting the fact that we would lose or the Sloan School would lose some of their best faculty to other business schools because of these bidding wars for faculty. And in fact, uh, the, uh, what do you call it, the option, real options theory was developed by Black, Scholes, and Merton. Okay, Black is often called Black Scholes. Well, Robert Merton got hired away to go up to Harvard Business School, and a few years ago he won the Nobel Prize for the work that they had done on real options and, and stuff. And I guess the derivatives come from some of those things or whatever. But it's, the whole financial market has been changed in the world because of that work. Um, now, Lester, talking not necessarily about Robert Merton, but about this hiring away to this business school up the road of some of the best faculty, because they have lots of money, they hire these people away. Um, he basically said, well, fortunately, they tend to hire our extinct volcanoes. Now, you know, you don't need to explain those two words. It's a little sound bite that conveys all the information. Okay? And so it's not its not necessarily the content of what he says, it's how he says it. Okay? Um, so we need to do a better job of teaching people to communicate things. Um, another kind of thing that I've been trying to tell them back for years that kind of goes over their heads is MIT takes some of the best raw talent in the world and turns them into high class technicians. Now that's a little hyperbole. Um, maybe, but it's, there is truth to it in the sense that we got top, you know, three out of 10,000 undergraduates and one out of 10,000 or better than that graduate students. And we tend to teach them that they are the technical problem solver. We don't give them the attitude 
that they are also the world leader, that they can become president of the nation or uh, head of uh, whatever it is, the World Bank or, or something like that. And it has nothing to do with whatever they've learned in school. Now, if I look back, I did my doctoral thesis in superconductivity, now I work in welding. Well, what's the relationship? The only relationship I've ever been able to come up with is they both, both involve high currents, high electrical currents, right? But, I mean, you know, what's the difference? I mean, one's talking about quantum mechanics and the other one's talking about, you know, uh, heating and beating and the type of metallurgy. Well, it doesn't really matter what you learn. If you learn how to learn, as Hutchins says, you're going to be able to go and learn anything you want. In fact, after you've been through um, this kind of doctoral education process, you ought to be able to pick up a book and within two weeks or a couple of books, research a subject and become close to being a world's expert in the field, okay? In terms of general overall knowledge and being able to predict what ought to be done. Uh, so we've got this problem of MIT, um, has very, very intelligent people, but we don't necessarily train them to think and have the attitude. One of the quotes I like uh, is from F. Scott Fitzgerald. The test of a first-rate intelligence is the ability to, to hold two opposed ideas in the mind at the same time and still retain the ability to function. I used to just hear that first part of that, and I finally found in a book a number of years ago the second part of the quote, which now made the thing make sense to me. One should, for example, be able to see that things are hopeless and yet be determined to make them otherwise. You've got to have the motivation to, in spite of impossible odds, to go forward and know that you can resolve those things. Um, and that's one of the problems of, of uh, uh, we've got these students who we teach them great technical competence in, certain, in a certain narrow field, but we don't necessarily instill in them the idea that they are the, the leader, the attitude that they are um, uh, should be one of the people that's making the decisions in the world. And that's why we tend to think they end up working for people who do make some of the decisions, who might be Yale and Harvard graduates, who may, or put that one up, who may not necessarily have a very good knowledge of the technical things they're making decisions about. I used to talk about it as repealing the laws of physics by fiat, okay? And when I worked at the steel company, there was a problem of corroding reinforcing bar on the bridges and the highways. In fact, you go down the highways in the summer and they're always repairing the bridges on the major highways. And that's because the, in the Northeast, the, um, they put salt on the roads and the salt gets down, uh, dissolves, in the, dissolves in the water, gets down, starts corroding, the, the, the rust and iron chloride uh, product expands and chips away the concrete. Uh, and this was a problem. And so someone at Bethlehem Steel, one manager, thought, well, why don't we make stainless steel clad reinforcing bar? But they made a lot of carbon steel reinforcing bar. And that way it wouldn't corrode. So they kind of started this project and went down to the, to the engineers. And the engineers looked at it and said, hmm, Stainless and steels don't have very good corrosion resistance and chlorides. This is a lousy idea. Sent it back up to the management, and the management says, a couple of managers got together and said, hmm, well, they say it's not a good idea, but we think we ought to do it anyway. Okay? So I sent it back down, and we did, my office mate was part of a 1974, a million dollar project, which was a lot of money back then, to make stainless and steel clad, clad rebar, which we all knew would not work. Okay? Um, but management said do it because they figured they could recall, repeal the laws of physics, in this case the laws of corrosion, by fiat. Well, it seemed like a good idea to them. Um, so the question is, why do you want to be an engineer? Why don't you want to be a leader? Well, you actually can be both. There's nothing that says that you can't be an engineer and a leader. In fact, when I was a student, just a long time ago, I came here as a freshman in 68. It wasn't all that many years since the, the midpoint of the century. And one of the business magazines, Forbes or Business Week or, or Fortune or something, had done a study of the top 10 business leaders who had built the United States in the first 50 years of the 20th century. And it turns out of the top 10, how many do you think were MIT graduates? Six out of 10. Six 
six out of ten came from MIT. Why? One of them was Albert Sloan. Okay, one of them I remember was Chrome George, George who kind of put together Alcoa and some others. Um, Albert Sloan who put together General Motors. Um, why? Because they have both a technical knowledge, and some of them, not necessarily because we train them that way, we actually, some of them actually pick up some of the other knowledge of how to communicate and do other things. They pick it up off the street. Or they're just very qualified people. Or they pick up the attitudes of humility and other things, which are important to be leaders. A number of years ago, uh, the MIT School of Engineering did a study, this is 1986, figuring out what types of qualities or what things we really should be training or educating our students in. And then two years later, Boeing came up with a list, which is the one I have here, um, that is search, sort of a copy of what the MIT folks uh, had come up with. And then it turns out Norm Augustine, chairman of uh, Martin Marriott, the Lockheed Martin Corporation, came up with a book, or not a book, but a talk in 1993 uh, in Colorado uh, at one of the universities um, where he talked about socio-engineering. You take MIT's list and Boeing's list and Augustine's list, they map right across. Everybody agrees what it takes, what are the qualities. And in fact, the, in 2000, the American Board of Engineering and Accreditation, ABET, which accredits engineering schools, came out with certain criteria. And those criteria are the same things and all these other great things. So here's the Boeing list. Um, should have a durable qualities all engineers should have is the way Boeing phrased it. They phrased it a little bit better. They put it in terms that people could understand better than the MIT School of Engineering report. A good grasp of engineering science fundamentals. MIT does a good job on that. Okay? A good understanding of the design process. Well, we do okay. It's not not we can always do better. A basic understanding of the context in which engineering is practiced. Economics, history, manufacturing, customer needs. Uh, we don't do so well in general. Good communication skills. Uh, you know, the MIT School of Humanities was formed uh, in 1950 because of the Lewis Commission. Warren Lewis was a professor of chemical engineering. He was charged with reviewing the whole MIT undergraduate program. In the meantime, MIT had a mid-century mid convocation over here at the, what used to be the Boston Gardens, torn down now, it's the Fleet Center, or the Shawmut Center, or whatever it's called. Uh, but same place where the Boston Celtics and the Bruins play. And Winston Churchill came, this is right after World War II, the Manhattan Project, radar, which if you go, you know, the room right next to where you get your breakfast is the room where the most valuable cargo ever to cross the Atlantic came to that room. There's a plaque on the wall outside that says that's where the radiation lab started in 4-131. Well, that's where in 1939, there's a book written about this, the machine that changed, the, the invention that changed the world. This is the name of the book, not the machine that changed the world. The invention that changed the world, this was the amplifier for, extra, for, um, for microwaves. And this was the beginning of radar. And in the middle of World War II, MIT had employed 3,500 people to bring that old plaque on the wall. They were making radar and sending radar sets out out to the war, okay, to, uh, to, to uh, help in the war effort. Anyway, Churchill after the Manhattan Project, they had atom the atomic bomb and, and radar and all the other technological things that had happened in World War II. He basically came and he said, he was reflecting on all this and the whole world in 1949 was worried about whether they were going to vaporize the world with you know, they were starting to work on Edward Teller, was starting to work on the, atomic, the hydrogen bomb and stuff. And he said, engineers should be humanists too. So the Lewis Commission comes out with its report and they say, 20% of the MIT undergraduate education should be taken in the humanities. Now, since gone up to 25%, but when I was a student, so 20%. That's still about double what it is in most other engineering schools, because the fact that those other engineering schools feel they don't have enough time to teach them film fill their minds that receptacle with all that information, right? Well, in any case, this was one of the reasons in the Lewis Commission, they were saying, you need better communication skills. And so we created the School of Humanities, except the School of Humanities doesn't really want to teach that, because that's sort of like service teaching, and nobody at MIT likes to do service teaching. That's, that's not scholarly. Um, so it's still a problem. Uh, an ability to think critically and creatively, independently and cooperatively. 
MIT actually does a very good job of that. Not necessarily in the classroom, not that we don't do some of that in the classroom, but really it's just interacting with your peers around here. As you see how they think, okay? It was amazing to me to just sit down at dinner as a student with my classmates and listen to some of their thought processes and the way they would analyze things, okay? Some of it I thought was correct, some of it I thought was wrong, and I suspect maybe they learned some things from me, but just being surrounded by a lot of outstanding people and listening to how they do things. Flexibility and ability and the self-confidence to adapt to rapid and major change. Uh, this is part of the humility equation. A profound understanding of the importance of teamwork. Um, Norm Augustine wrote a little pamphlet called 12 Qualities of Leader. He's considered one of the great leaders of engineering uh, in the country. He's a Princeton grad, but he's on the MIT Corporation, and he's chairman of the uh, visiting committee for the uh, uh, Engineering Systems Division. So he had a list, character, vision, confidence, energy, courage, perseverance, motivation, self selflessness and teamwork, decisiveness, judgment, mentoring, and listening as important qualities. So if we look at character, David O. McKay once said, character is the true make that is the aim of true education. And science, history, and literature are but means to accomplish this desired end. True education seeks to make men and women not only good mathematicians, proficient linguists, profound scientists, and brilliant, brilliant literary lights, but also honest people with virtue, temperance, and brotherly love. It seeks to make men and women who prize truth, justice, wisdom, benevolence, and self-control as the choicest acquisitions of a successful life. Um, so that's character. Vision, uh, I'm not going to say too much about, but if we talk in confidence, like I said, MIT does a pretty good job. Energy and courage. Energy, we do pretty well. Hard work. That's the hard work thing. The ideal person, this is Hutchins again, I'll get a new overhead of this. This one's old. The ideal person is the one who is willing to learn, but who thinks for himself, who respects the convictions of others, but who will stand up for his own against any power whatsoever. Okay? Um, you respect other people's opinions, but you're willing to stand up for what you think is right, no matter what the consequences are. One of the biggest problems I see in management, not just at MIT, but at other locations, is people who are doing their job today in hopes of getting the next job. Okay? They're making decisions to please their boss not to do what's right for the people all around them, for the whole system. Okay? Uh, so far as perseverance, Teddy Roosevelt said, whenever you're asked if you can do a job, tell them, certainly I can, then get busy and find out how to do it. Okay? You don't have to learn how to do it. I often tell students that you might be trained as a chemical engineer, but if you go into your boss and your boss says, we have this accounting problem, you better solve the accounting problem, even if you don't know anything about accounting. That's what you've got to solve, is whatever the problem is. Uh, that's why it really doesn't matter what you learn in school. You know, I don't mind teaching a welding and joining course to students who really don't care about welding and joining because, you know, it doesn't really matter. It's more your thought process and the attitudes than the approach to things. Another thing, so far as motivation, when you're dealing with people, never attribute to malice that which can be adequately explained by ignorance. I don't believe that most people go home at the end of the day saying, boy, I'm really glad I did a lousy job today. Okay? I think very few people do that. Now, people may go home and say, I really wasn't able to accomplish what I should have done today because my boss wouldn't allow me to do it the right way. Okay? They're micromanaging me. Okay? But they don't go home and say, I did a really lousy job and I'm proud of it. In fact, they lose pride in their work when they're forced to do it the wrong way. Um, so far as teamwork, my quote on teamwork has to do with Petranius Arbiter of Greek Navy. We trained hard, but it seemed that every time we were beginning to form up into teams, we would be reorganized. I was to learn later in life that we tend to meet any new situation by reorganizing, and a wonderful method it can be for creating the illusion of progress while producing confusion, inefficiency, and demoralization. Okay? It's rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic. And in 210 BC, Petronius Arbiter noted that that's what was happening. And it hasn't changed a whole lot, has it? Um, so as far as decisiveness, William James said, when you have to make a choice and don't make it, that in itself is a choice, is a decision. Um, so far as judgment, 
Albert Einstein said, any intellectual fool can make things bigger, more complex, and more violent. It takes a touch of genius and a lot of courage to move in the opposite direction. And I think I've told you the story about, uh, to a certain extent, my career. Um, a lot, if you read the book, that everything I needed to know I learned in kindergarten. Well, for me, I was a little late. It was second grade. I was in an Easter egg hunt. And some child says, ooh, I saw an Easter egg. Well, all the kids go running there over there, just like the second grade soccer game, right? They all go run to the ball. But that's not where you're supposed to go. Wayne Gretzky was asked why he was a great hockey player. He says, because I never, I never skated to where the puck was. I always skated to where it was going to be, right? Anyway, what happened to me is the child says, oh, I found an Easter egg. And we all went running over there. I was a little late getting there. And I'm looking at the backs of about 10 different heads. And I think, there's no way with these other 20 eyes looking at looking at the ground there that I'm going to find an Easter egg here before them. Okay, I got to have a little bit of humility. I didn't think it all out exactly this way as a second grader, but I realized I'm going to go look over there where no one else is looking. And sure enough, I could find the nuggets where other people weren't looking. Okay, so um, it's sort of been a philosophy for me to not work on something that everybody else in the world wants to work on. So right now. Nanotechnology. It's the last thing I want to work on is what everyone else is working on. Why? Because I believe there's a lot of smart people out there, and many of them are smarter than me, and I don't want to compete with them. So I'm going to work and try to figure out what's going to be important, and how can I uh, how can I make some contribution to that. So far as mentoring, there is a principle that uh, uh, I learned from. Uh, a scout master when I was doing, dealing with scouts. And this principle works for any decision I ever had to make in scouting. And it actually works pretty well for any decision I have to make when I'm dealing with other people in general. Bird Van Eyre used to say, the purpose of scouting is to encourage boys, not to discourage them. And so whatever the question was in scouting, I would always ask myself, would the proposed solution encourage or discourage. For example, um, when I was department head, one of the professors here came to me and he wanted to, this, I had inherited a, a big deficit and I didn't have a whole lot of money. He came to me and he wanted a new rug for his office. It was 20 years old. And he wanted to know if the department would pay for it. Well, I really didn't have the money, but I did have a $7 million budget and what's for a rug cost. But I said, you know, Fred, I'll tell you what, I'll split it with you 50-50. So it ended up costing me $1,500, it cost him $1,500, and he walked out happy, right? Now, more recently, the department's gotten itself into financial problems again, and someone asked, can we buy a clock for the Xerox room? And the answer was, no, we can't afford it. Now it's a $10 million budget, and they can't afford a $10 clock? It's ridiculous, okay? It's discouraging to people to think that they can't afford to do what they need to do. Um, so you gotta try to encourage encourage people um, and listen to them and whatnot. Okay, um, so now let me finish up. It won't take too much longer if you have to go to the class you can. Let me just finish the lecture. Leaders versus managers. No one ever managed anyone into battle. Grace Hopper was the uh, um, person who invented football as a business language in the late 50s, early 60s. Just like um, Admiral Ricker, Congress every few years had to extend her retirement date. Um, but she stayed in the Navy, I think, until she was in her 80s. Uh, there's also a, book, a little book called The Tao of Pooh. And the Tao of Pooh, Taoism is, uh, is kind of yin yang, you know, and it's kind of go with the flow. Whereas Confucianism is this philosophy, is a whole set of rules, and that's how you're supposed to follow you know, uh, things in your life. So it's a question of rules versus principles, in a sense. Or you can call it the lesser law and the higher law. There's some religions that believe that when Moses came down and found that the, the uh, Israelites were worshiping an idol, and he broke the plates that he came down the mountain from the first time, and then chastised them and went back up and came back with the Ten Commandments, the second set of plates, some people believe that the first set of plates contained a different set of rules that were principle-based, 
rather than rule-based. The Ten Commandments are pretty much rule-based. Thou shalt not, right? But the higher law is really more thou shalt. What should you do rather than what you shouldn't do? And so when you're managing people, you really need to think about who it is that you're trying to manage. Some people need a lot of rules. Other people, if they're relatively intelligent and motivated, only need principles, as far as that goes. Um, now, if you've got time, I might as well tell the story. When I first became department head, I was concerned that not very many of the faculty knew much about uh, engineering, or not about manufacturing, and so I actually asked a faculty meeting of 30 people, I said, how many people know what a CPK is, which is the process capability? No one else in the room, mostly because Professor Clark wasn't there, he would have known. And today, 10 years later, probably only four or five people in that room would know what a CPK is. And in fact, back in uh, the early 90s, the CEOs of Motorola, Kodak, and AT&T, and IBM, about 10 different CEOs of major corporations got together because they wanted university professors to learn about total quality management. Uh, and so they said, we will take 50 to 75 of your faculty and we'll put them through our intensive uh, one-week course at our companies on total quality management. Well, it turns out MIT got the, uh, was selected uh, since we were close by. Um, we went to the IBM course. And so we went out to this IBM corporate education facility. Beautiful, Taj Mahal, and, you know, just off the Hudson River. Just wonderful food, beautiful facilities. And uh, we learned what uh, IBM's version of TQM is, Build Quality Management. Well, I remember, um, I, I decided that the sophomores ought to learn some of these things, so I started teaching it when I became department head as some sort of seminars to the undergraduates, I remember, I said, anybody here know what uh, total quality management is? And one of the students in the back room says, oh, shit. I said, oh, okay. Well, you know, and I, you know, a lot of people would agree with you. Fortunately, I took TQM first from Cho Cho Choji Shiba, and who's an excellent teacher of it, and I really got a more positive view than just straight bullshit. But in fact, I said, well, why do you think all these CEOs are spending millions of dollars? I figured it cost IBM $400,000 to wine us and dine us and for a week at their corporate education center. Just that was just MIT, and then these other schools were doing it. And of course, they were doing it for their own people all the time. They were probably spending tens of millions of dollars a year teaching people uh, total quality management. Well, the student didn't have an answer for that. I said, well, it's because if you're dealing with MIT people, you probably can do things principle-based. But if you're dealing with a lot of other people who don't know how to solve problems, let's face it, you wouldn't be at MIT if you didn't know how to solve problems. You wouldn't have made it this far. But for a lot of other people, looking at a bar chart, or a pie, graph, pie chart, or a run chart, or whatever you want to call it, it's a revelation to collect data and organize it. And it's a new way. And so they, some people need to follow rules. And so depending on the people you're working with, you may want something that's rule-based, okay, or you may want something that's principle-based. Now, principle-based is the higher law. One time someone asked uh, uh, Joseph Smith what, how he's managing his big organization. He says, I teach them correct principles and they govern themselves, okay? If you've got a good group of people, then you can teach them principles and let them do it themselves, they will be much better off. David Ogilvy said, it does an organization no good when its leader refuses to share his leadership function with his lieutenants. The more centers of leadership you find in a company, the stronger it will become. Uh, Lao Tzu, who I think is uh, one of the Taoism people, the wicked leader is he who the people despise, the good leader is he who the people revere, the great leader is he who the people say we did it ourselves. Okay? A really great leader is going to motivate other people to accomplish things themselves. And they really are most successful if the uh, people have been able to accomplish it, things and feel like they did it themselves. Strange as it sounds, the great leaders gain authority by giving it away. Or the little puppet 
I use, when you use your authority, you lose your authority. Okay? If people, if you start micromanaging people and telling them what to do, then they are going to quit listening to you. Um, and faculty are among the worst. I remember I was walking down the hall uh, a number of years ago, probably 12 years, 13 years ago. I had just become director of the Materials Processing Center, my first real administrative job dealing with faculty. And Tom Lee uh, was coming down the hall. Tom Lee had a very distinguished career, member of the National Academy of Engineering, he become a vice president of General Electric, and retired at 65. Came back to MIT as an adjunct professor. A few years later, he was made head of the International Atomic Energy Commission in Vienna, and then came back to MIT after serving there for two or three years, and it turns out Professor Melcher died of uh, cancer suddenly. And Tom Lee was asked to take over the management of the Lee's laboratory here at MIT, uh, the lab for electronic, you know, electromagnetic and electronic systems. And so I said, well, congratulations, and you're going to congratulating me, I congratulated him. I said, what do you think of, of it? He said, well, you know, when I was at uh, General Electric, I really didn't have any authority as the vice president, but everyone treated me as if I did. And then um, when I was uh, chairman of the International Atomic Energy Commission, I had absolute authority, and everyone knew it. The problem with managing things at the university is you don't really have any authority, and everyone knows it. And so you can't use it. Now, there's a very influential what influential for me, not influential worldwide, but it was kind of a watershed for me to read this article, which was actually a commencement address at a university in 1982 called Leaders versus Managers. And the uh, Hugh Nibley points out that the uh, German high command tried desperately for 100 years to train up a generation of leaders for the German army, but it never worked. Because the men who delighted their superiors, the managers, got the high commands, while the men who delighted the lower ranks, the leaders, got reprimands. Okay? Um, so they were always managed and micromanaged. And he says, leaders are movers and shakers, original, inventive, unpredictable, imaginative, full of surprises that they stump the enemy in war and the main office in peace. For the managers are safe, conservative, predictable, conforming organization men and team players, dedicated to the establishment. The leader, for example, has a passion for each Equality. You can think of great generals from David and Alexander on down, sharing their beans or masa with their men, calling them by their first names, marching along with them in the heat, sleeping on the ground, and being first over the wall. And that's part of the difference between a leader and a manager. For the manager, the idea of equality is repugnant and even counterproductive. When promotion, perks, privilege, and power are the name of the game, all in reverence to rank is everything, the inspiration and motivation of all good men. Where would management be without the inflexible paper processing, dress standards, attention to proper social, political, and religious affiliation, vigilant watch over habits and attitudes that gratify the stockholders and satisfy security? That is why the rise of management always marks the decline of culture. So thinking about this, I think I may have told you this before, how can you tell before you walk through the door whether you want to work for a company? you look at the number of signed parking spaces in the parking lot. A, it tells you management doesn't get in early, and it tells you they have a hierarchical attitude where all the thought process comes down from on high. Nothing comes from bottom up. They don't respect the contributions of the other people in their workforce, and therefore there's one or two brains running the organization rather than a few hundred brains. Okay? Managers don't promote individuals whose confidence might threaten their own position. And so as the power of management spreads ever wider, the quality deteriorates, if that's possible. In short, while management shuns equality, it feeds on mediocrity. On the other hand, leadership is an escape from mediocrity, the leader being simply the one who sets the highest example. And then he goes on. True leaders are inspiring because they are inspired, caught up in a higher purpose, devoid of personal ambition, idealistic, and incorruptible. Remember the courage and integrity stuff. Leaders versus managers. The manager knows the price of everything and the value of nothing because for him, the value is the price. So after having read this a few years ago, all of a sudden I realized what bothers, has been bothering me for 20 some years about business schools. 
Business schools teach management, they don't teach leadership. And so to conclude, I'll actually conclude with the, the overhead that actually got this whole talk started many years ago. What happened is I was at a dinner one night with the Vice President John Poe and he was talking about leadership and teaching leadership and he pointed out that Peter Drucker, uh, a management uh, consultant uh, and a very, very thoughtful person, once said that a leader is someone who gets the right things done. And there's two parts to that. They get things done and they do the right things. Okay. Um, they do more than is required. Uh, that is required of them. They balance per professional and personal responsibilities. The, in this, uh, let me just say, if you're not doing well in your personal life, you're not going to do well at work. You're not going to be able to handle things. A leader respects the contributions of everyone, not just their peers at the top. A leader is going to respect the people who are the custodians who clean the restrooms and respect the contributions that they make to the organization. They contribute back to the community. They don't just take what they uh, take things from the community, they give things back. They take initiative. They don't just wait to be told something, they decide what needs to be done and go ahead and get it done whether they're uh, asked to or not. And finally, they follow others when they're not leaving. Okay? I like this. So, uh, it's always good to conclude with a quote from someone else. Before I came here, I was confused on this subject. Having listened to your lecture, I'm still confused, but on a higher level. Thank you. Thank you.